Okay, welcome everyone to our next class on causality. Um, today we continue with probabilities. There's much more to say than what we said last time. Last time I think we talked about PDF, CDFs, quantile function. Um, oh yeah, here it is. We talked about real valued random variables and we introduced kind of, we introduced them by just sampling from the NumPy function rand and just gener generating uniformly distributed um, values and look, looking at a histogram. And somehow the histogram is describing the randomness of this random variable. And this could be summarized by using the PDF, the probability density function, okay? And alternatively, we could also integrate out from minus infinity to x to get the cumulative distribution function. So that, that's another way to describe it. But the information content is very similar because if we take the derivative of the cumulative distribution function, we get the PDF. And then there's the inverse of the CDF, and that's the quantile function. And we have to write it, <coughs> excuse me, somewhat complicated with an infimum here, because the CDF might be constant to one or constant to some value. And so the inverse might not be defined. And so to be always defined, we have to take the infimum, which you can also view like the minimal x with a certain property. So minimum would be also OK, because the CDF is continuous from the right. Um, as an example, we looked at the uniform random variable, which is a variable ranging on the real numbers from 0 to 1. It has a particular density, which we call u of z, and we can also write it with these Iverson brackets. So the Iverson brackets are just evaluating some Boolean expression inside, and if the Boolean expression is true, it's a return a 1, and if, if it's false, they return a 0. So it's just like the indicator function without the indices. Yeah, So it's a... I think a better notation. And um, we could, for example, also write the CDF of a uniform distribution using the Iverson brackets. So we would say, if we are in the interval between 0 and 1, basically we have the linear function, z, OK? And if we are larger, then we are constant 1. And if we are smaller, we are 0. So we don't need an expression for that one. <clears throat> So we can also calculate the inverse of Z1 for the interval from 0 to 1. It makes sense to talk about the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. And for the uniform distribution, it's just Z, OK? So it's just the identity function. So this is not derivative or anything. It's just another Z. It's a Z prime, OK? So far, so good. Um, we also talked a little bit about probabilities for continuous random variables. So given that we have uh, random variable x with a certain density. Uh, the one surprising thing is that for a particular value on the real line, the probability of seeing that one is 0. Yeah, That's very common because um, in continuous random variables, the probability of a Gaussian distribution to be exactly being equal to pi or exactly being equal to 0, the probability is 0. So with continuous variables, you only get some non-zero probabilities if you integrate over some small interval. Okay, And so typically, uh, we could ask what's the probability that x is in some certain interval, okay? And why intervals? Those are the ones where we know how to do measure theory on, okay? So that's where Lebesgue integration is defined and all these things that we don't worry too much about it. But that's somehow a relation to more advanced statistical stuff, okay? In principle, we can plug in here any logical formula, yeah? And as long as the set of values for x that makes this formula true is a measurable set, then the integral will be defined. So we could also define uh, x is in some measurable set and write it like this. So that's also possible. Yeah? But that's something we leave to the hardcore statistician. So in our cases, usually everything is nice and easy. Good. Then the next thing we looked at were transformations. And um, the basic assumption that helped us derive all the necessary formulas was that probabilities should be preserved under transformations. OK, so if I have a Gaussian random variable, let's say mean 0, variance 1, I can calculate the probability that the value is between minus 1 and plus 1. Now suppose I transform my random variable by shifting it with a plus 5 or scaling it or also even doing some nonlinear transformation. Yeah, then the probabilities shouldn't change. So if I have a certain bound, minus 1 to plus 1, I would also map these bounds 
to the new world with a new real line, yeah? And then the probabilities should stay the same. And if we use um, this desideratum, yeah, so this wish, then the way to do it is basically following the formulas that we derive down here. And where basically this derivative over here plays exactly the same rule like an integration by substitution. So there we also get like the first derivative of some functions involved. Yeah? So that's basically it. Some special transformations, they led to some interesting results. So suppose we um, transform our random variable with the um, CDF. So that was quite curious. We get a uniform distributed random variable out of this. So you can take any distribution, whether Gaussian or whatever, or a mixture of Gaussian, and if you transform it with the corresponding CDF, um, you get a uniform distribution. This in insight um, leads to a way to sample from an arbitrary distribution where we know the PDF. So given the PDF, we, if we are able to derive the quantile function, right, which is the inverse of the CDF, yeah, so we need to integrate our PDF to get the CDF and then isolate basically uh, the X, then we have the quantile function. Then we can use this function and transform a uniform distributed random variable into a random variable with any distribution. Okay, that is kind of neat that this is possible. <coughs> In particular, as computer scientists, these transformations are important because transformations are computer programs, some, com some de deterministic functions. Okay, so that's something very natural to ask. If I have data where I'm assuming it follows a certain random variable, so how does it change, okay, if I apply a computer program? What distribution do I get? Yeah? It's like having implemented functions for the real numbers. Now, how could I lift them into the world of distributions? Yeah, that's what these things are doing. Okay, great. What are we doing next? So next we are looking at multivariate random variables. So instead of having a single real number, we look at several real numbers. Yeah? And then we need new notions. Uh, one will be the joint PDF we will introduce, which is like the summary of all random variables. And there will be also a joint CDF. And then there are marginal PDFs and conditional PDFs, some rule product rule. And then next we talk also about discrete random variables and so on and so forth, okay? Let's see how far we get today. Okay, so multivariate random variables. And again, if there's something unclear, yeah, you can use the luxury of sitting here with so few students that you can ask any questions and we have plenty of time to answer them all. Okay, so multivariate random variables. So far we looked at uniform random variables, okay? So x was distributed according to some density and x was from the r to the 1, okay? They are also called scalars. More generally, we could talk about multivariate random variables which are now vectors, okay? Sometimes these are called random numbers then, and these are called random vectors, okay? For me as a computer scientist, they are just random variables, and the type of the variable could be a scalar or a vector or a function or whatever. Um, for simplicity, I will introduce all the notions, like on joint, marginal, and all these things, just for a pair of random variables. So that is like the simplest departure from a scalar, and it's like the the simplest vector that is kind of non-trivial, okay? So we are looking at a pair of random variables. That's easier to write everything down and less messy. So here one word about notation. So in computer science at least, and maybe in statistics too, like the semantics of this function p is somewhat overloaded, yeah? So, so we write p of x or p of y, but different to mathematics, it's not the same p but it will depend on what input we plug in here. So if I write the small letter x, I'm referring to the density of random variable capital X. And if I put a y in here, I'm referring to the random variable of capital Y, okay? That looks like a stupid idea to do, but it's very handy when you have really big joint distributions with many variables, and it's very easy to talk about whatever the p of a given b and c or something, and we don't have to worry about these sub-indices. In principle, the joint distribution is defining them all. So basically, from p of x comma y, from the joint distribution of x and y, we can get all of those and we can get conditionals and we could give each of them a different name, but that would be even more confusing, okay? So this, this is an, a nice notation. 
However, when you talk about transformation of variables, typically it's a good idea to have these sub-indices here as well, okay? Just as we did in the last lecture. So if you talk about plugging in something more complicated than just the letter Y, then typically we would, we would use the sub-index to make it really clear what we are talking about, okay? So let's start with the joint distribution. So the joint PDF yeah, of a pair of random variables will fully describe the two-dimensional histogram of a pair of real-valued random variables. So if I have, um, let's see whether this works. Let me switch to the iPad. How can I get a new page? I can't. OK, then I erase everything. Looks like I need to practice this a little bit more. There must be a better way. Oh, no. OK, so let's try it. Um, so if I have two random variables and I get a sample from them, yeah, it's like having like a 2D board and you are throwing darts at them, right? OK, and so maybe you hit it once here. And of course, then I can throw darts very often and I get maybe these impacts. And they define a probability distribution, like in 2D now. It's not like a 1D probability distribution now. Every point gives you two numbers. But of course, um, now you could also think of this like going into 3D, that there are the densities like a function on top of this one, okay? And similarly, we could also do a 2D histogram, where a 2D histogram would now um, put a grid on this one like that, and I would count in each bin how many points I have, okay? This histogram is really boring. There are not so many points. But if I would have um, many more points, yeah, then basically the histogram, the 2D histogram is now a 2D mat a matrix, which is the same as a 1D histogram. And similarly, for the 1D histogram, I can also describe it with the probability density function, with a two-dimensional function, basically with the function P of x comma y. So if you want to view it like a, a 3D thing, I don't know whether I can draw it. And this is P of x comma y. And then, I don't know, we will have something like this. So there will be a bump going up and then some bump going down again. So I think you get the idea. So it could be some little bump that then again corresponds to the same thing. So we are basically can do the same thing as before. But now we are doing it for a matrix of numbers, OK? So, and this joint PDF describes everything that is to know about the random variables x and y, OK? At least everything statistical. There's more to know about them causally, but that's something for next lecture. But in statistics, that's all we can say about it. Um, now for pairs, um, of course, we can also calculate probabilities but now the probability is not the, the area um, below the PDF, but it's now the volume below this two-dimensional curve, okay? So we would ask x is in a certain interval and y is in a certain interval. And for example, those could be, the bins could be described like that. And so those could be the value that you have on each of them. And so now this is a double integral, yeah? where we are not worrying about switching integration signs and all these things. We just do it. We don't, we don't worry about the math. So if in doubt, we ask our, the experts from the skyscraper building of the mathematicians. Um, curiously now, so how is this a logical formula? I mean, we use the comma in here, right? But intuitively, we did it right, kind of. We say this is like and. Yeah? So if we have several statements in here that could be true, they are like connected with an and sign. Okay, so the semantics of the comma is the same as the, the end, the logical end, okay? And again, disclaimer, everything about measurability still must hold, so the whole thing must be measurable somehow, and now in 2D. But of course, there's the generalization of the Borel measure space, which we haven't talked about it, but the one that you start with intervals, you can also have it in 2D and in higher dimensions. So it's, it's all nice and, and fine. So the joint CDF now, so this is the joint PDF, we can also define the joint cumulative distribution function. And that is basically now integrating our joint PDF for each variable separately. So from minus infinity um, 
to y and from minus infinity to x, okay? And again here, let's see, how do I get a new page on my, on my thing here? Let's, or maybe, okay, so now, okay, I got it. So let me switch again to the iPad. Um, let's just, um, Uh, let's just um, see what the CDF is really calculating, okay? So this is X and Y, and we could color it for the density, so there must be now in 3D there or something. I now just want to say what is the area that we are calculating. And the area will be, for the X, we will have minus infinity until a particular value of X0, for example, okay? And for the y, we are calculating something for a particular value y0 until minus infinity. So the CDF is calculating basically the volume for such a infinitely large square. Yeah, for the 1D CDF, we were coming from minus infinity and going towards plus infinity. Here we are going with two variables at the same time towards infinity comma infinity but we could first go with one and then with the other, or we can stop in between for them, okay? So that is the CDF. It looks a bit arbitrary, right? Because like in, in 1D, you're going from left to right, and here are many more possibility. You could also go from top to left, right, bottom, blah, but this is like the natural generalization of this one. Okay, let me change here one little setting in, um, in OBS, which will simplify my life. Um, so if I switch to OBS, I want to see the iPad. Okay. okay. So now it should work. Yes. Does it work? No, it does not. Okay, now I, I killed it. Um, so if I do that one, I want to see the iPad. Okay, now it should work. Yes, okay, very good. Okay, so that is the joint CDF. And it looks like a natural generalization. At least if I would go back to one variable, I would get the common CDF that we had before um, as a special case. Of course, now, if we would go through three variables, we would grow such a cube in 3D, okay? Um, now, can, how can I go back from the joint CDF? How could I get back to my PDF, right? Before, we've seen that you just take the derivative of the CDF and then you get the PDF. But here's a little bit unclear how you get back to it, but we will see it's also about the derivatives. First, let's look at some properties. So if I'm having a fixed Y and I'm looking at the joint CDF and let X go to minus infinity, the whole thing will go to zero for all values of Y. Okay, that's an interesting property. Similarly for X. Um, okay, this is a general law that we have, but one can show, so that is the usual thing that we use for the usual CDF, but one can also show for two dimensions that if I take first the derivative with respect to y, and of that one the derivative with respect to x, I will get the PDF, okay? So that is the exact relation between the multivariate CDF and the multivariate joint distribution, okay? You take derivative with both of the variables. What else can we do? So now, starting with the joint PDF, how can we get univariate PDFs from it as special cases? And there are two ways to do that, okay? The first thing is we just ignore the y, yeah? So we don't care for the value of y, yeah? We just want to marginalize it out. And this is done using the sum rule. We will see in a second the math for that one. And the second option is that we say, oh, I'm, I'm interested in the y, but only in a very particular value of the y star, okay? And I'm interested for that one. And this gives us a conditional PDF, okay? And curiously, for that one, we will need the product rule. So those are the two essential rules here. So let's first look at the marginal PDF and the sum rule. So, <coughs> excuse me, by taking the derivative with respect to the first um, x here, I will get the marginal distribution. So that's a way to define the marginal distribution. I allow the y to be anything, okay? So basically plus infinity, I could plug in plus infinity also for the y. 
Okay? And then taking the first derivative, I will get the PDF of, uh, so the marginal PDF for x, and similarly for y. Curiously, this is exactly the same as the, the derivative of my CDF if I only look at the first variable. Um, having this definition for the marginal PDF, we can now, def uh, we can now um, prove the so-called sum rule, okay? So if that is my definition, yeah, that this is the first derivative, yeah, then I now want to derive a formula that says integrating out the y, okay, if I integrate out the y out of the joint distribution, I will end up with the p of x, which was defined up here, okay? So now having this definition for my p of x, I want to prove that the p of x is also equal to integrating out the y, okay? So how do I do this? Let's plug it in. Um, let's plug in the definition of my um, uh, joint CDF, which is integral up to x and up to infinity here, where here we have to be careful with the x. Now this is an x prime, right? Because I have a p of x on the other side, so this variable is like free. And so it is free appearing also as a bound for the outer integration. So I need to use a different letter. So now that I'm using here x prime is of course on purpose because that was our convention that by plugging the right letter in, I know what joint distribution we are talking about. I could have put in here an A, and then the convention would have been the first input to my joint distribution is for X, the second input is for Y. But having this X prime is like very convenient. Okay, I can change the inner integration and I can move it out of the whole thing, yeah? And there are deeper mathematical reasons why this is allowed, okay? So I have the derivative of this function over here, and basically the y here is constant inside these brackets, okay? And then it's just Leibniz rule. So if you take the derivative of such an integral, you get the function evaluated at x, okay? That's just a fact from Muffin, mathematics for, ma for informatics. Is it Muffin? No, what do you call it? Muffin. Muffy. Um, okay, muffin is something else, fine. Okay, and that proves the sum rule, okay? Of course, alternatively, we could have said uh, we are not defining the marginal like that. Instead, we are defining the marginal to be the integral of um, integrating out the y out of the joint. That would have been a different option to define the marginal distribution, okay? And then we also would get the sum rule by definition, yeah? So I don't know which one is more common. So that was the one that I liked more. So I picked that one. I said there are two ways. So here's the other way. So the conditional PDF and the product rule. That's another way to get a marginal distribution. So suppose I'm fixing my random variable y to a particular value. Okay, so I'm interested in the joint distribution where y is equal to a y star. Um, this gives me already some non-negative function p of x comma y star, where here only the x is varying, but the y star is constant. Um, however, this function is not normalized, right? It's only normalized if I integrate out the x and the y. But if I plug in a single y, then the thing is not normalized. It doesn't integrate to 1, okay? So it's not a PDF. So what we need to do is we need to normalize it. So let's calculate the normalizing factor. It's just integrating out the x, okay? And by the sum rule from the previous um, page, we know that this is exactly p of y star. Okay, so this follows from the theorem from the previous one. Thus, now, we can normalize this p of x comma y star by dividing it by p of y star. And hereby, we normalize it in such a way that the result integrated over x will be equal to 1. And this thing gets a new name. It gets this special notation p of x given y star, okay? And it also has a special name that this is the conditional PDF, condition on a particular value, okay? Um, okay, so far so good. Um, if you think of, let's say you are collecting your 2D histogram in a big Excel sheet, okay? So you have a big matrix of numbers, yeah? Then one way to get a distribution or to get like a histogram for the x is by just summing up all rows, okay? This is integrating out the y, summing up all rows, and you end up with a row 
that rho that varies for the different values of x. And by summing it up, you will get a distribution that does just the right thing, which will also integrate to 1. The other option is that you ignore all other rows, but the rows where y is equal to y star. And this gives you now numbers that are not normalized, so you need to normalize them by summing up this row. And the sum up of the row is just a p of y star. OK, so one option, marginalization, means collapsing the whole table by summing up all rows. Basically, conditioning means you are conditioning on one of the rows. OK, and this is giving you um, another possible probability distribution for x. Good, and um, those roots now could be written down as um, like a calculus to, to do interesting calculation with PDF. So the sum rule is so you can, you can get rid of variables going from here to here. And the product rule basically is now another way to write um, the conditional distribution, which also works if the p of x is equal to 0. Right? So the definition of the conditional distribution doesn't work if you divide by a 0. So those are the two rules, and they work for PDFs. So you can apply them for PDFs. So this could be a Gaussian PDF. It could be a different Gaussian PDF. And you can multiply to Gaussian PDFs to get another Gaussian PDF. Okay? There are different variations of this one. Yeah? So for example, of course, I can do the sum rule for y. No surprise. I can change the roles of x and y in the product rule. Okay? No surprise. I can combine the product rule for x and for y, and I get base rule. Okay? So base rule just follows from two versions of the product rule. I can also replace uh, the p of y by the integration, and I get another nice form of base rule. Um, where I basically write this bottom part here, which is also called the evidence, I write as an integral, okay? Why is it nice? Because let's say you, do a, you want to specify a model. So the only thing you need to specify is you need to specify p of x. That is like a prior distribution for x. And you specify a likelihood, p of y given x. And then the whole model is specified because the evidence you can calculate by normalizing the top part in this formula here, OK? And this gives you then the posterior distribution. And it's all sum rule and product rule cleverly combined, OK? And the other nice corresponding thing is sum rule corresponds to marginalization or to marginal distributions. Product rule corresponds to conditioning, OK? It's all nice, nicely built up. So far, so good. Any questions about this joint business? OK, then the next step will be transformations. But now we want to do it for multivariate transformations, OK? That's way more scary. And there are some empty spots where I couldn't find material, OK? I will point out the empty spots. And uh, maybe you from data science, you are more close to the math department or to the statisticians. Statistician, if you find someone, you ask them maybe. You can help me here out. And um, you can fill in the holes. So that would be great. I did lots of Googling and reading, and I couldn't find it. But there must be tricks for the missing cases. OK, what cases am I talking about? In general, I want to now look at functions from r to the n to r to the n, OK? So I have a multivariate distribution for a vector x, and I have a vector as the output with some function f, OK? Um, and in more general, I even want to have a differently dimensioned space. So it could be r to the n to r to the m. And the n could be smaller or larger than the m. So those are basically covering all cases. But let's start with that one. And um, let's just write down the formula that we had. OK, that is our transformation formula that we already have. And actually, it also works for the other case. The only key thing here is the function must be invertible, which is for high dimensional functions not always the case, of course. Also for 1D functions, not always. But in high D, it's even, even easier kind of to fold stuff up or to collapse stuff together. But suppose it is invertible. Yeah, there is also a function that inverts f, which is this x of y. And what we need here is the derivative of this inverted function. However, this dx dy is now for an nd case. It's the so-called Jacobian of my inverse function. Okay, So the Jacobian is from um, Mafi 2, maybe, from Mafi 2, or also Mafi 1. I don't know. But where you basically look at um, 
high dimensional functions and you look at the, um, yeah, basically you're looking functions from R to the N to R to the N and then you are talking about the derivatives. And the derivatives is not a single number anymore but now it's a whole matrix. And this matrix is called the Jacobian, okay? So this is the 2D um, derivative stuff. The absolute value here now are the absolute value of the determinant. So the determinant of such a matrix is telling us something how the volume is changing under this linear mapping, okay? So for really nice introduction to all these things, determinant linear mappings, there's this nice YouTube channel, three blue, one brown, which you might know. So that is very useful with nice visualization. And the visualization there if, of a linear mapping is usually that the space is kind of sheared, something or maybe flipped or something. And the question is always what happens to a volume element if you take a square and you apply the linear mapping, how does it change? And in particular, if it has volume one, what is the volume of the result? And this volume is, or the area, and this volume or area is exactly the determinant. So the determinant is telling you how it's, the volume is changing. Okay, that's useful for this densities, right? Because density is about something like kilogram per square meters or kilogram per volume or something. Yeah, and now we multiply it with a scaling that tells us how the volume is changing. So it will adjust the density just right to get the right density then for the adjusted space, okay? So the determinant is about the volume change. The other thing is, if that is the right formula, that's also good because then the univariate one is a special case, which is always nice, okay? The simplest case for the univariate one is just alpha times x, which is also, you are changing volumes by scaling with the parameter of alpha. <clears throat> and so the scaling of the density will be one divided by alpha. So let's look at a more general setup. Now we have n and m, but now the m, the space where we end up is smaller than the space where we started, okay? So in a way we are losing transformation, uh, we are losing information right? But nonetheless, suppose you have a 3D Gaussian distribution here, and now I project it with a linear mapping into a two-dimensional space, it is probably still a Gaussian distribution, but now a 2D Gaussian distribution, right? And actually it is, there is a transformation formula for Gaussians, that high-dimensional Gaussians transformed with a linear mapping will be lower-dimensional Gaussian distributions. However, what happens in the super general case, maybe even now the f is not invertible, right? We are squishing together something. So we cannot use the formula from before because there we needed an invertible mapping. So how can we do this? So here's the trick. So the trick is to generate a new function g, which is now going from r to the n to r to the n. So how can I do it? I just extend my function f. So the m was smaller than the n. So the my f is just defined by, let's say it's going from uh, r to the 10 to r to the 5 or, or to r to the 3. So I, there are seven empty spots and I can use these seven empty spots with some expressions that I invent in such a way to get an invertible mapping. Okay, but this is not trivial to do in general. But I show you an example how this can be done. Okay, so if that's possible, we can use this trick. Here's the first hole. What can we do if that is not possible? So what about the general case for m less than n? Okay, so what can we do? How can we do a transformation? If we have this invertible higher dimensional mapping, then we can just use the trick from the previous slide. And then at the end, um, integrate out the unused dimensions. And for this one, I want to show you an example. Okay, this is a joint distribution. And in this case, we, we use a simple one. We say we have a factorizing joint distribution. Factorizing in this case just means that the joint distribution happens to be the product of the marginals. Yeah? That basically means the random variables are independent. We haven't defined that. I will define it, I think, on later slides. But um, let's just say, so this is a joint distribution, okay? Um, now, my mapping is, I'm mapping from the R to the 2 into the R to the 1 by taking the quotient. Okay, and of course, this is not always defined, so there are some funny cases where x is equal to zero, 
Let's gloss over that one. Let's ignore it. Okay, let's say we are somewhere where we can do it. And then, of course, this guy will have a density, right? I mean, there will be some probability density. You can imagine I can sample lots of x1s, I sample lots of x2s, and then I generate the quotient and I can look at the histogram. So this will give me some density. Okay, so can I also derive it formally? Um, okay, first of all, observation. Oh, this is unfortunately not invertible. So unfortunately, I cannot directly use the formula from the previous one. However, let's extend it. So let's, as the first output, we use the one that we want, so the x1 divided by x2, and the second one now we choose cleverly, okay? And there where you have to get creative, and you have to be able now from these two numbers to invert the mapping, okay? So is it possible? Um, yes, it is. Curiously, the x1 is y1 times y2, right? If I multiply these two things, I end up with x1. Similarly, the, the y2 is equal to x2, so that inversion is very easy. Okay, so by this choice down here, yeah, I now extended my mapping into an r to the 2 to r to the 2 mapping, which is invertible. And now here I can apply the tricks that we had before. Okay, however, the step going from a given mapping, yeah, that is not invertible, going to a mapping G, that is quite non-trivial, I think. It's not so easy to come up with something clever here. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so the inverse transformation is that one. We need to have the Jacobian of the inverse transformation. So that is then basically now I only wrote it like this, the partial x1 to y1 and x1 to y2 and so on and so forth. So the Jacobian distribution, uh, the Jacobian, not distribution, the Jacobian matrix. And if we apply this, so calculating x1 is now y1, y2, and calculating the derivative with respect to y1, we end up with y2. Okay. Similarly, the distribution of x1 with respect to y2 is y1. The, uh, the derivative of x2, which is now the y2 with respect to y1, is equal to 0, and with respect to y2 is equal to 1. Okay. So that is my Jacobian matrix. Okay, how do you calculate determinants of 2D of 2 by 2 matrices? You multiply along the diagonal minus the other diagonal. Okay, in this case, it is just y. And then we need to take the absolute value, okay, because it's the absolute value of the determinant. Okay, great. Let's plug everything in. So now the joint distribution of y1 and y2, yeah, of the output of our extended mapping will be the density of that we had from x1 and x2 plugged in the transformation, right? So these are the transform values plugged into the density for x times the, the determinant of the Jacobian. Okay, this one factorizes, fine, okay, that was just an assumption. Um, are we done yet? No, actually we want to have the density of y1 and not of y1 y2, but only of y1. So we need to apply the sum rule. So we can then just write p of y1 is equal to integrate out the y2 now. And um, I don't do this calculation now because I haven't specified the px1 and the px2. But you could imagine that if you have a particular distribution, maybe you can do this numerically or maybe even in closed form solution. Yeah. So nice. What we just did is we had, we had a non-invertible mapping yeah, from R2 R to R1, R to the 1, and we derived the density in the lower dimensional space. Okay, so this was going beyond the case R to the N to R to the N. Yeah? So far, so good. What else can we do? So the other case was M less than N, okay, where... Um, Possibly we cannot find such a clever function g which extends it to an invertible map. What can we do? Okay, so this is my question. Anyone knows how to do this or anyone knows a super clever statistic, statistics professor and she can tell us? So that would be great. Um, then there are other embeddings. So my embedding space could be higher dimensional than my starting point. And in a way, 
That should be possible too, right? So suppose you have a 2D Gaussian and you embed it into 3D. So that should work. However, it's a bit funny because like the 2D thing is like on a sheet of paper, it's flat, okay? And if I embed it into 3D, it's still flat. So the volume is still zero. So there are some weird things happening here. Yeah? In particular, it's, it's related to this delta function issue thing, where you basically are in 1D, and then there's this weird delta function, which has like a discrete point that integrates to 1. And I think the second case is related to a higher dimensional delta something. So maybe the answer is, oh yeah, um, it's all easy when you talk about distribution theory. So I guess that is something that you need to do, distribution theory with delta functions and stuff like that. I don't know enough about it. Anyway, so that, those are interesting questions. Um, do we need it? Uh, maybe we do a calculation like that, the one where we go from r to z2 to r to z1, yeah? And then maybe we can have tricks, and maybe there's an example in the exercises about it. We won't do the ones, of course, where there are empty holes in my brain, of course, right? So those, those are, of course, too difficult. I also don't know how to do it. But it's interesting to think about it. So we somehow need to integrate along manifolds in high ID, and the integration should be equal to one. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges. Um, yeah, so I don't have material here, but if some of you have, I would be curious. Why do I want to have that? Because as a computer scientist, for me, my transformations are programs, so they could be anything. They could go from M to N or N to M. Could be neural networks, so it would be nice to also have the correct mathematical theory for that one. So that would be nice, right? And if it's not possible, it would be nice to understand why it's not possible, of course. Okay, so far so good. So this is transformation of variables for the multivariate case. Okay, any questions so far? No. Okay, let's go on discrete variables. Who, discrete variables, that's the simplest case. Why is it coming now? Um, the reason being, I, I thought it's nice to have a slightly different introduction to probability theory in, in this lecture because you've seen probability theory already so often. And typically you'll probably start with coins and dice. So let's do it the other way around. Let's start with the function rand and first look at histograms and get PDFs and then from univariate to bivariate to multivariate. And then let's fill up the rest that is missing. Discrete variables, of course, super important. Uh, let's look at it. How can we do it now with what we built up so far? Uh, we just use transformation on our uniform random variable z. Okay, so we just now define a function which is turning a random variable z into a discrete random variable. Okay, and we have the function already. We can use the Iverson bracket. Okay, so the Iverson bracket is turning um, some statement from two false into zero one, and we just use it to split the unit interval into two pieces, okay? So suppose now I'm having some parameter theta, which is like the parameter of a Bernoulli distribution, the probability of seeing hats, yeah? Um, and then we just say the statement is, now my, um, my transformation function, which transforms my uniform distribution, is the function coin of R. So the coin of R takes a number between 0 and 1, sampled from uniform distribution, and turns it into 1 and 0, into two discrete things. Okay? So that's it. Um, and now to define a discrete random variable, we just say C is equal to coin of Z, where we use again the capital letters. Nice? Somehow, right? Of course, the question is now, what is the PDF of a coin? So that's weird because PDFs are for continuous variables. And as we will see, there are no PDFs, but we will have probability mass function. But um, oh, before we do that, of course, we can do the same with the dice. So let's say we want to generate a six-sided dice. Yeah, we use this weird looking function, which is basically, so this is the floor function. Yeah, it, it's uh, the largest number smaller than x. In computer science, we call it floor. There's also one the other way around, which is called the ceiling function, okay? And by multiplying a number from zero to one times six, okay, I'm getting a number from zero to six. 
and by taking the floor of that one, I'm getting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that's it. I never get the 6. Okay, so I have to make sure that I never get the 6. So that's the way to get the dice. And we can define a random variable by using this transformation. Okay, interesting, right? I mean, now we just use these discretizing functions to get discrete random variables, but we haven't talked about probability ma mass function or PDFs about it. Let's look at probabilities. Again, probabilities must be preserved. So that is the thing. Under transformations, probabilities must be preserved. So let's see what probabilities we get if we, um, ah, yeah, use some, some basic derivation here. So the probability that our coin is equal to one, yeah, can be seen like the probability of applying the inverse function of my, of my um, transformation. And now the inverse function here is generating I me mean, not a single number, but it's generating a whole interval, okay? So this is really the Urbild function, or in English, the pre-image. And the pre-image is a set. So the pre-image of one is a set from zero to theta, okay? Okay, this is good because this probability is defined. It's the integral from zero to theta of my uniform distribution. And the uniform distribution is constant one. So the integral will be equal to theta. Similarly, I can calculate the probability of C being equal to zero. And again, I'm taking the pre-image function of this discrete function. And again, you see here, I have to juggle a little bit. So pre-image function is a bit ugly but it's because we are going from continuous to discrete, so there must be somewhere we must hide the, some ugliness in here. And similarly, we can also do the calculation for dice, okay? So a coin having only finitely many values, okay, um, we can also use a different notation. So we can just explicitly write little p now for my random variable c of the different possibilities. And we say that is the probability of c b equal to one. And this is now different from the PDFs. It's only similar to the PDFs. We use the same small letter because the small p will have the same properties as our PDFs, but they are slightly different. First of all, note that also summing up all possibility leads to one. Yeah? That's just because our mapping from the continuous world to the discrete world was basically covering all possibilities of inputs that would come from zero to one. All of them were mapped to one of the discrete values. That's important, especially if you do the dice. Yeah, there there shouldn't be any, any interval left on the unit interval. Everything must be used somehow to generate the discrete numbers. And then we have the summation being equal to one. And that corresponds to integrating a PDF over the whole space. Similarly for the dice. Here the ugliness might be that it's d equal to zero to five. That's a bit programming style, okay? So now this randomness is, of course, fully described by this little piece here. And they get a new name. They are now called probability mass function. Yeah? So this little p is now called the probability mass function. And so the probability density function, the density is referring to some infinitely, infinitely small piece that has some density, like some kilogram divided by volume or something. So probability mass function is chopping the interval in finite pieces, and each of them have a, have a mass. So that's why we don't need a density, but we can write down the absolute, so the absolute values, the, the real, the, the mass values. So, but they are very related with each other. Okay, let's generalize also to more than two, uh, uh, more than one discrete random variable. So of course there's a joint PMF, a marginal PNF, and a conditional PNF. Okay, everything is the same. Also for PMFs, we will omit the sub-indices if it's clear from the context. So we will write the joint PMF as P of X comma Y. Okay, the marginal one we also get from the sum rule. Yeah, and in this case, the sum rule defines the marginal PMF. Um, and also we have a conditional rule, which basically is defining us some conditional distributions. Okay. If we do that, also our definitions of PMF fulfill the sum rule and the product rule. And um, I don't specify here P is a PDF of X and Y or P is a PMF of X and Y because everything is the same. 
no matter whether it's a PDF or whether it's a PMF, okay? We will have the same rules. In particular, we have base rule and everything. Just the integration is either an integration or it's a summation, okay? So everything is nice. Okay, um, so far so good. Any questions? So let's think back. We start with continuous random variables or we start with the uni, we start with rand, which is a uniformly distributed random variable. And then we look at trans, we get PDFs. We look at transformations of that one to get different univariate distributions. And then we extend that to 2D and to ND to get uni uh, multivariate distributions and now we use transformations again to get also discrete probabilities, okay? Okay, so far so good. What's next? Um, so there's more to say. Um, in, in principle, we can plug in arbitrary logical statements in here. However, so far, we only plugged in like the random variable has a particular value. And for that one, we wrote the P of D is equal to blah, blah, blah for the probability mass functions, okay? And that was kind of nice. So the D being equal to little d, yeah, the D was the dice function applied to a continuous random variable. So we can take the pre-image again, the Urbild function. And this gives us some nice integral and everything is great. However, we can also plug in arbitrary sets in here into this probability thing. So we could say, D is less than three, okay? And that is the same as summing up these discrete events. Yeah, so with discrete variables, everything is even more easy. We could also take the Urbild of this one. Yeah, we could also say, so how is it? When is it dice to the minus one of D? When is it less than three? So we could do that one as well. And um, then we just get the right interval and we will j get just the right numbers. But we can also do it like this. Um, by the way, these discrete variables are not necessarily having finitely many values, but they could be infinitely many values, but countably many infinite values. <coughs> An example, famous example is the Poisson distribution, right, which is a distribution on all positive natural numbers. Okay, now, again, let's look at the relation between PMF and PDFs. They are very related. Both describe histograms, okay? Actually, they are very related because at the beginning, if we think about it, if we, if we write down a histogram with finitely many bins or with countably infinite many bins, actually the histogram is a PMF, okay? So the histogram is actually defined by a probability mass function. So in a, in a way, yeah, the PDF is a continuous version of our PMF. Yeah, so it's like the, the, the thing for making the intervals go, so the bins going to zero, so of size zero. Both have basically the same properties where we only sometimes need to replace a summation sign by an integration sign. Okay, so that makes the notation really nice. Okay, if we have some insights for the PMFs, typically they apply also for the PDFs. Okay, so far so good. Um, any questions up to here? No, that's great. Um, let's continue a bit about probability. So this is more, more a bit talking about some other subtleties that are out there, right? So we had this kind of non-standard way of defining things. However, there are more proper ways of defining things from the statistics department. They really know how to do it, the real mathematicians. So, for example, probability measure could be defined. Um, however, at the end, the stuff that we defined fulfills all of this, okay? Up to some corner cases that you can define. But in principle, we are compatible with the usual definition of a probability measure. And so there's a definition from Kolmogorov what a probability measure is. And typically, we have some... Um, some sigma al algebra, yeah, where I haven't defined what a sigma algebra is. So let's first talk about a sigma algebra. So given a set R, where R you could think of of the real numbers, for example, or of the R to the two, or the R to the three. A sigma algebra is basically a, a collection of subsets, or you could also say the sigma algebra, sigma is a subset of the power set of R. 
But power sets of continuum things are always a bit funny. So let's say it's a collection of subsets of R. Okay, so that's maybe nicer. And they are defined by an inductive definition. So inductive definition means there are some starting cases. So if R is in there, yeah, that's our starting point maybe. And we put some other stuff in, maybe all intervals or maybe some discrete sets or whatever. You can choose yourself. And then there are some updates. So if there's already, <coughs> excuse me, if there are already a set in there, then the complement of it should be in there too. So in particular, if R is in there, then the empty set will be in there too because the empty set is a complement of R. And now if we would have countably many disjoint sets in my sigma, then also the union of those should be also in here. Now you might think, so this looks like an arbitrary definition. So why define sigma algebras? Who cares? It is all about measure theory. It's all about generalizing, measuring things, okay? And typically you measure things with a yardstick. Yeah, you can measure uh, the length of this super expensive wide piece of plastic. Um, and you measure it's 20 centimeters, uh, you can measure whatever, the table, and so on and so forth. You can also measure areas by multiplying these lengths and you get the area of the table or the volume of the table. Now mathematically, what is it? How can we make it super precise what could be measured, okay? And the way to do it are the so-called Borel sigma algebra, which is, a special, which is a special sigma algebra, which starts here with the whole space and then with all intervals. And all intervals could be seen, all the stuff you can measure with a yardstick, okay, or a Zollstock. And then you apply these rules to create other things, which also makes sense, right? So if I could calculate the length of that one and I could calculate the, the length of some other interval, of course I can also measure the length of the union of the two. Or also if they touch each other, that also works, okay? And curiously, also, if I have infinitely many of those, but countably many, then it also makes sense to say that this thing will have a length. For example, the first pen has a length of one, the next one of a half, the next one of a quarter, and so on and so forth. So the length of all these countably infinitely many pens should be defined to be two, okay? Because it's converging against two. And we could also exclude things, like saying, Okay, the, um, let's take the uh, all real numbers and let's remove all rational numbers so we can have these weird sets. So these weird sets, maybe we don't want to have it because we don't know how we could basically measure it with a yardstick and so we don't want to include it. So there are some weird sets that you want to include it. And if you exclude all these weird sets, you don't have any products are. If you include this weird set as well, then you, you have these strange paradoxes where you can have like a, a sphere that you chop into pieces and you build it again and you have two spheres. Yeah, I forgot the name of the paradox on. Okay, maybe Dagati, yeah. So something with two spheres that you can double the volume. And when you first hear it, it doesn't make sense. But the whole idea of this split into pieces is you need a saw yeah, that chops it into unmeasurable pieces and then you rebuild it and suddenly you have double the volume. Yeah, so you are cheating. That's related to hotel infinity, yeah, which you might know. Anyway, so that's the whole story about the sigma algebra. It's just a construction to nail down what we mean by measuring, okay? So we want to measure probabilities and I'm always very generous and say, yeah, you can put whatever logical formula in here, yeah, and then you can measure it. Ideally, the pieces of my logical formula are measurable and then everything will be fine. But if you plug in a logical formula which defines some Hilbert sets or some other weird fractals or something, maybe you can also end up with something that is not measurable. But anyway, so to really nail it down, Kolmogorov and colleagues developed measure theory which required this complicated thing called a sigma algebra and they say, oh, we only say something about the content of the sigma algebra. We only define probabilities for the elements in here and for no one else. And we have the following convention. We say, first of all, our measure should be greater or equal to zero. Yeah, so that makes sense if you measure something. But then the special thing here is, if I measure everything, the whole space, I want to have one. And that's different from a yardstick. Yeah, in a yardstick, it would be more something like infinity. And we need the other, other thing here, for countably many disjoint sets, yeah, I define it um, to be 
yeah, just a summation of the, the simple probabilities over here. Yeah? And here you, you need to make sure that um, such infinite sums are all defined. Okay? However, we know that the summation of everything is one. So if I have countably many pieces, probably I'm fine yeah? by summing them up. It kind of makes sense to do it. And there are no strange things. Some consequences of these assumptions are, so one can prove for probability measure that the probability of the empty set will be zero. And also the probability of any subset will be less than or equal to one. Okay? And one can also prove that if I have a subset, then the probability of the subsets is smaller. And those should be capital P's. Okay? Can you send me in the chat maybe if you think of that I need to change this? So those could, should be capital P's here. Okay, so that is basically like the mathematician's way of doing things. And um, we can also have for two random variables like a properly defined um, joint probability measure. Um, if we want to properly write it down, um, we need to start with two sigma algebras for each of these random variables and then to define what it means to be like a sigma algebra on pairs of um, random variables. So we need to generalize all of this. and I. One needs to generate the measure, and so on and so forth. Um, so as an example, ah, no, no, OK, so this was a continuous random variable. There I need this pro joint probability measure. However, the thing is, you can do the same thing also for discrete random variables, so the so-called cell mass. I don't know what it's in English, counting measure or the count measure. So there's a, a certain measure which then leads to the discrete case. Okay, so in principle, you only need to talk about Kolmogorov's probability measures, and that's where you need to derive your theorems from, do the, uh, yeah, do the heavy work, and then you say there are some special measures for continuous variables, some have even a PDF, and then there are some for the counting measure, and then everything is fine. Okay? However, I think the way we introduce these things are more intuitive and they are more closer to the data. So that's why I introduce it another way. And it's also good to see a different perspective. Um, there are some strange things, but um, let's first look at the simple stuff. So first of all, um, yeah, OK. So there is also a marginal probability measure. Yeah, So that's just how you would expect it. It's just a probability distribution for all the elements of the sigma algebra from x. Yeah, so basically, it's if you have a joint sigma algebra, there's also what, like the left projection and some right projection thing. Probably one can also define it more general. But if you write it out, then everything is fine. And so the marginal probability measure is then to to be defined to be this probability where I just add all the other variables, but I say I integrate over the whole over the whole range. Okay, so that's how you get the marginal ones from by Kolmogorov. For the conditional probability measure, now this is getting more weird because there are two possibilities how to do it. So you could condition on a particular value. yeah. So that's one possibility. And um, now using this conditional probability density function that we defined before, that's one option. But there's another option. In general, I could also condition um, on events, and I could say y is in a certain event set. That's conditioning my possibilities for y. And this is changing the distribution of x. And it could be defined using discrete probabilities. So now where are you here, the discrete probabilities? So basically now x being equal, uh, x being element in A, this is defining a new discrete random variable, which is either true or false. And also P, uh, y in B is defining a discrete random variable, which is either true and false. And so this definition basically comes from the discrete probability world. Yeah? However, I can also define it via the densities, if the densities exist. However, there are some funny things. There's a Borel-Kolmogorov paradox. I think there will be another slide on it. Just a second. So where is it? Do I have it here? Yeah, this is a slide on it. Um, I skipped a little bit. We will go back to the slides that I just skipped. But so there is this borel kolmogorov paradox because so there's one way to define it using just these P 
PDFs, which are defined to be the quotients. Okay, and that is something that works. However, the other way to define it would be to, to try to define it as a quotient, but then I would have to define by dividing by P of capital Y being equal to little y, which is zero. Okay, so the other way to define the, the conditional probability would be here to divide by um, a set that has measure zero, which is bad. And so there are like two ways to get to the conditional probabilities, and one of them is kind of strange, but actually it would be nice if everything would be compatible with each other, but it's not. And the whole thing is called the borel kolmogorov paradox, and it's a bit more involved. And it's only for those of you who really want to go into the foundations and see how it works. It's not required really for exam or for exercises or something. It's drilling a bit too deep here, okay? Okay, let's step back to where we were. Um, again, we can ask the question, and I partially answered it already, what could you plug in here? Yeah? What kind of expressions could you plug into probabilities, into joint probability me um, measures? And the thing is, again, in principle, any propositional formula, okay, any logical formula that kind of evaluates the true and false, as long as the set of true values is measurable, okay, then everything is fine. So to be more specific, specific, we could define a function e, where the, the letter e is still really bad because later we also define e to be the expectation. But let's ignore this. So the e on this slide means event, okay? So we can define the event. And um, so we could say x is in A and y is in B, and then we say it's true or it's false. And so this event function is tell defining us a new random variable, um, which we then can use to, to specify, uh, specify exactly what this probability is, okay? So that's another discretization here. And we only need, again, the pre-images of this event function in this case, which is, again, a set of possibilities. And as long as the pre-images are in my sigma algebra, yeah, I can calculate the probability. By the way, what I wrote, just wrote down here, yeah, if that is the case, that the pre-image is in the sigma algebra yeah, of xy, then my event function is a measurable function. So that is exactly the definition of measurableness. So measurableness means please be compatible with the sigma algebras involved so that I can go back and forth, okay? But don't worry too much about it. I'm just saying measure theory is really not super complicated. It's all quite natural at the end, okay? And here we want to have measurability. If we have measurability of E, then the probability of this event is properly defined, okay? That's it. Okay, so far so good. Um, why, don't, why do we need sigma additivity and not just finite additivity? That was another question that I had when I come up with these slides. So the sigma is referring to the infinite summation, right? And why don't we just need um, finite additivity? I'm not answering here. This is just a question for you to chew on if you are interested in these kind of foundations. So why do we need this, okay? By the way, if you find out, please put it on the chat. I'd be curious too. I forgot the answer. I mean, my example was with the one and a half and a quarter and so on. So it kind of makes sense that sometimes you have infinitely many events and they all sum up to something finite, right? And I guess that is the answer. But maybe other people have thought about it and there might be some uh, stack exchange answer to that one. Yeah, so would be fun to find out. By the way, the goal of all this is to get some, to get our hands dirty with probabilities, okay, and to get some solid foundations, because in causality we will extend the notion of a joint distribution with somewhat more complicated models, where we have more assumptions and we have more knowledge built in, and so it's good to have the the basis. Yeah, the base is defined with some useful notation, which we can go back back to. Okay, so far so good. Independent, so that's something we haven't talked about. Um, so the product of two marginals defines, of course, a joint distribution. We've seen that already, yeah? 
By the way, why is that the case? Any ideas? So why do is the product of two marginals, why does it define a joint distribution? Why is it the case? What do we have to prove? Maybe base rule? Maybe, yeah, no, but in this case not. But often, often base rule is the answer, definitely. What do we have to show that the P of X comma Y defined like Z is a PDF? Maybe that's just my question. So what do we have to prove? Yes, exactly. So let's do that. So we need to show that everything is positive, and we need to prove that um, the integral is equal to 1. OK? So now I found a new button that you can have a new page. OK, so OK, great. OK, so let's do this. So first of all, what about, uh, let's take another color. OK, so p of x comma y but maybe I need a better handwriting if we want to do it like this. So this is my definition. And now to prove that this is a PDF, I need to show that P of X comma Y is greater or equal to zero. So any ideas why that is true? Yes, exactly. So both factors are greater than zero. So the product is also greater than zero. Okay, very good. Next one, we need to integrate out both variables. Any ideas how we would do that one? If not, let's just plug it in. What can we do? We want to show that this is equal to 1. Any ideas how to do it? You can also answer in German, by the way. Don't worry. Yeah. Genau. Ja. Exactly right. So they have nothing to do with each other. So we can reshuffle the terms, like the factors. And you were suggesting basically to to reshuffle it like this, right? Yeah. Times. And of course, that is a bit okay. Why are we allowed to do that? The reason, of course, being we can p of x can be dragged out of the inner integration because the p of x doesn't depend on... Ah, okay. We first should swap... Um, okay, let, that is basically where we want to go. And um, we first... Let me do it by erasing, or let's take a red button. So we first swap the dy and the dx. We can swap those. Yeah. And then there's this inner integral here, this one here. is about dy but it has nothing to do with p of x. p of x is just a constant. So we can drag it out of the integration, right? And then, oh, let's do this. So this is integral of p of x, and then we have the integral of p of y dy dx. And then we do the same step again. We say, OK, this integral has nothing to do with x, OK? So we can drag it out. And then we have exactly what you said. And then this thing is equal to 1, this thing is equal to 1. So everything is equal to 1. Yeah? OK. So this is like a, a simple thing that, that, should be, that you should be able to do, ideally. OK? OK, so now, um, where were we? We were from going from marginals to joint distribution, OK? So if I have two marginals, I can define a joint distribution. Um, now the question is, can we also do it the other way around? Does it mean if I have any joint distribution, actually it's enough to specify the marginals, right? Um, there the answer is no. That's not, not enough. Because 
going from the marginals to the joints, there's only one possibility to do it. But in principle, there are many possibilities how to get from two marginal distributions to a joint distribution. And also let me draw an image for that one. So let's say um, I'm having here a Gaussian distribution, and that's another Gaussian distribution, OK? Those are two distributions. This is x, and this is y. Now, those are the marginal distributions. That's why I put them on the axis, OK? And now a possible joint distribution looks like this. So this is a 2D Gaussian distribution, yeah? where the marginal distribution is the Gaussian, and the other one is the Gaussian too. However, I can also draw other Gaussian distributions in here. And if you take the marginals of those, they also have exactly these marginal distributions. So the variables could be very correlated or uncorrelated. Okay, so it's not always the, there are many, given the, the PDFs, yeah, uh, the, given the marginal PDFs, does not specify the joint PDFs. But the other way around, that's true. Okay. Okay, so to uniquely determine a joint distribution, what we could do is to use the product rule. So I could specify the marginal distribution for x, and then I take the marginal distribution, uh, not the marginal, but the conditional distribution of y given x. And then by multiplying those two, I get a joint distribution. Yeah? But there are many possibilities to choose this distribution. It doesn't have to be the p of y. So the y could depend on the x. I could also do it the other way around, OK? Um, so this special situation where the joint distribution factorizes into the marginal distribution, this special case gets a name, and this is independence. So two random variables are called independent, and that's exactly what you say. They somehow have nothing to do with each other. Um, that is independent if, if the joint distribution is just the product of the marginals. That's it. And um, when you play around a little bit with the product and some rules, um, then you can also derive that the marginal distribution is equal to the conditional distribution, where you condition on y. So basically, it doesn't matter, the input of y doesn't matter for the distribution of p of x given y, okay, in case of independence, and also the other way around. Um, <clears throat> we can also have a general, more general form here. So we could also say, x and y are conditionally independent given a third variable, okay? So there could be another variable, and only if we know that one, then in that case, they are independent. If we don't know that variable, maybe they are not independent, okay? So if there are situations where x and y are independent if I observe z, yeah? But they are not independent if I don't observe the z, okay? So now I should have a good example for that one. Maybe that would be useful, okay? So OK, here comes the example that we were looking for. So this is an example where um, x and y are dependent, but x and y, given that, that I observe that, they are independent. And the example goes as follows. So that is some random parameter from, for a coin flip, OK? So Z is something, some parameter from 0 to 1. And for example, it could be distributed according to some beta distribution. That's just the distributions, the priors that you use for parameters of coin flips. So it's from a beta 1, 1 distribution, OK? Whatever a beta distribution is. Let's say it's a random parameter. Different way to say it um, is I have a box of coins, yeah, and the, the coins, they have all different uh, fairness, so they have different parameters theta, and I'm picking one of them, okay? And um, then, having picked one of these coins, I don't throw it, I just pick it. So the first event is to pick a parameter. And then I have x given z will be Bernoulli with this parameter z, or you can also say it's a coin flip with parameter z, and the y given z is also Bernoulli, blah, 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 with the same parameter. Now, what about the independencies? So suppose um, I know that 
I observe that. So I tell you, I pick one, and then I say, oh yeah, that is a coin with 0 0.9. Okay, so it's very likely to see heads. Then suddenly the, the coin flips that I do afterwards are independent of each other, because two coin flips are independent of each other. I flip the coin twice. So I take the 0 0.9, and x, one, uh, x is the result of flipping the coin once, and um, y is flipping the coin again. However, the outcome of my first coin is, does not give me any additional information to the information that the coin has parameter 0 0.9. So 0 0.9 is already a sufficient statistic, kind of. It's all there is to know about the coin. So in that case, the two coin flips are really independent. However, suppose I pick a coin and I don't tell you, so you don't know Z, you don't know the parameter. And then I throw the coin once, that's X, and it's heads. In that case, um, it could be that now you would guess that my second throw is more likely heads too. Because if it was head, it's most likely probably from the fair, unfair coins which are leading towards heads. So it's getting more likely that it's from the other, from the unfair coins. So the probability of seeing heads again is increased. So now they are um, dependent on each other. Okay, so this is a case when I observe the parameter, yeah, they are independent, the coin flips, but when I don't observe them, they are dependent on each other. Okay? Okay, thanks a lot. So, okay, let's go on. Here's some more definitions I want to finish today before starting with other stuff. Expectation. So now this is a new E. It's not the E from events. It's a new E. So the expectation, also called expected value of an expression that has some random variable in here, yeah, is the PDF weighted integral. That now first sounds a bit more complicated than what you're used to, but let's say you're just taking the expectation of x, then that is the typical expectation that you had with x, but this is a step more general with having a function f in there as well. Um, sometimes we omit the brackets, so sometimes we just write ex, so that could be super nice. Um, here are examples, so the mean is e of x, if you have a random variable x. But there are other things. You can express the variance as the expectation of x minus the expectation of x squared, OK? So the average squared distance to the mean is the variance, OK? Um, note that this is not the same as squaring the thing outside. Again, here you need to be careful with the brackets. So the square here is inside the expectation. And again, expectation is a linear operator, yeah, because it's integration and something. So squaring is a nonlinear function, so it doesn't commute with a nonlinear function. Okay, um, writing this out is basically the integration of little x minus e of capital X, and integrated against p of x. Okay, and then of course um, this e x in here is also a little integral. Right? It's the integral here of x against p of x. So there are two variables x here involved. So one needs to be a little bit careful. But then this notation is very short. But you always have to be careful which random variable is bound by which expectation operator. So this x here is bound by the first expectation operator. And the second x is bound by the outer expectation operator. Okay. Curiously, you can also express probabilities ex as expectations, yeah? So taking the expectation over the Iverson brackets, yeah, giving us exactly the probability of x being in a set EA. That's also fun, right? So expectations can be used to define probabilities, yeah? Which is also nice. So maybe one could also tell the story totally differently and first start with... Um, Rand and with expectations, like averaging or something, and then um, taking expectations of these Iverson bracket transformations to get probabilities, and then taking derivatives of these guys to get PDFs. Yeah, so that should lead to the same stuff. Um, oh, here's more, more things on conditioning. Uh, did I want to say more about conditioning? Yeah, let's say a little bit more about conditioning. Um, so we could define, as a so-called Mogorov defines conditional, the conditional measure, 
yeah? So this is a conditional probability measure. By saying, suppose I have two events, yeah, where events means A and B are bros from my sigma algebra, in such a way that the probability measure of B is greater than zero. Then I can define the conditional probability now also just as a quotient, okay? And this is an, also a definition, but then it also immediately leads to the product rule for the probability measure. <coughs> Excuse me. Special cases. So there is this weird special case for discrete probabilities, yeah, where you really define by p of y given uh, by p of y being equal to little y. You're only allowed to do this because we are talking about discrete probabilities. Otherwise, this thing down here would be zero. Yeah. For so conditioning on single events for continuous probabilities is not possible with Kolmogorov's definition of the conditional probability measure. So it's more restrictive with that respect. Yeah. Um, however, there is a trick to do it. If we have densities, we can do it in a slightly different way, but this leads to the disturbing borel kolmogorov paradox that I already mentioned. Okay. Um, so maybe I should reshuffle the slide. So this is at the wrong location right now. So it should be moved earlier to the earlier in the lecture. Okay, let's continue with expectations. Oh, why this is really a mix-up of slides? Okay. Okay, now let's not continue it. Let's stop at this one. So this is the last slide of today. Any questions? Okay, thanks a lot. So that's the end of the lecture.